I was thinking about how do I start this off, and I'm like, let's talk about your childhood. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking more like, what did they put in the water at your home? Was there something special about what your parents did? You would love my parents if you met them. They are, you know, just very typical kind of Brooklyn-born, New York Jewish parents. The one thing I will say about my childhood, though, is that both my parents are doctors, and I think it would have been very easy for them to encourage their children to go into medicine. That's what they knew. My dad's dental office was in our house. So I, I always knew that it was his dream that one of his children would take it over, but to their credit, they never once pushed any of us into medicine. I think somewhere inside they knew that the careers that we would have didn't even exist yet. Why do you and, say that? That's interesting. You know, when I think about the careers even that my own children will have, they probably, you know, it's going to be things with AI and robotics and machine learning and, and things that we don't even know could be careers. And I think somewhere deep down, my parents both knew that, even though it would have been so easy for them to encourage us to go into medicine. And I think that was a huge thing that they did for us, leaving us open for that curiosity because uh, I can see Mark, Mark did some pretty great things. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did Mark want to be when he grew up? I always loved theater and music. I wanted to sing on Broadway. It was my life passion. Mm -hmm. I sang opera, I did theater my entire childhood. Um, up until I got rejected from the music major at college and had to have my first entrepreneurial pivot, if you will. But um, that was, I mean, my, my whole passion. Mark, I mean, he was always talented at a lot of things. I think he really developed a passion for computers and for writing code really early on. He always was building games and building little things and testing things out. So you could definitely tell really early on that he was definitely going to be some kind of a, a creative inventing genius. What was your relationship? relationship with, with Mark growing up? What were you uh, as siblings? There was a lot of Nintendo, many hours of Nintendo. Uh, Mario Karts was the Nintendo game of choice. One of the funniest memories that I have with Mark and I growing up is uh, our mom was really nervous about Y2K. You know, everyone thought that the world was going to end and computers were going to somehow explode. And um, so at the countdown to New Year's Eve that year, we snuck into the back of the house and cut the circuit breaker at midnight, which is so mean, but so awesome. And uh, we were super grounded for a really long time, but I would still go back and do it again. It was worth it. And so what, what was your mom's reaction? Screaming. Like just screaming, like Y2K is happening, you know, all the electronics went out. So I still think that might have been our greatest prank of all time. I know that um, Mark talked in particular about your mom and how strong she was. How much did she motivate you guys? Was there a kind of a, a special connection there? I definitely always had a very special connection with my mom. I mean, even to this day, she is one of my best friends. She made some pretty tough decisions with her life. She had, you know, two young children while she was in medical school. She was balancing being a mom of four children and going and finishing her residency and, and grappling with a lot of that. Um, and so I, for me, I always really looked up to her and looked up and she was kind of my, my beacon of, you know, you can have it all. You just have to focus at any given time of your life. And it's, I, I'm so lucky that we had such a strong role model, female role model in our life. Do you have any memories that stick out? That just really defines like childhood at the Zuckerbergs. Mm, we were always making these very creative projects, which we thought were masterpieces at the time. And then, you know, when you go back and look at them, like they're very clearly projects children make. But the one that I still have sitting on my bookshelf to this day is a video called the Star Wars Syllogy. And we were so into Star Wars, you know, we were that super geeky, nerdy household, and we decided we were going to create our own Star Wars trilogy, but a parody version called The Syllogy. And, you know, of course, I wrote and directed and filmed the entire thing. Mark played Luke Skywalker. His voice hadn't even changed yet. Our two little sisters, who were too young to have lines, just like sat in a garbage can and beeped and walked around. <laughs> and like, we thought it was just like a cinematic masterpiece. We were so proud. We worked on it for, I mean, for weeks, if not months. So I think that really embodies what the spirit was in our household. We were always up to something creative. We were always inventing, we were always collaborating, we were always like looking for any technology we could find and using it to just, you know, create something bigger. What role did tech play in this? 
I mean, everything was tech in that. We had one of those giant camcorders that, I mean, I don't even know if I could lift it up today. Mm -hmm. You know, we're printing things out on the printers with the, you know, the spools on the edge and the perforated edges and printing out our scripts. But we, you know, we were trying to do all of these things. We had these toys that, you know, with voice changers and just trying to kind of MacGyver together anything we could. And um, I think that was so indicative of our childhood. If you look back, like we were always filming things, writing songs, just trying anything, any creative mode that we could invent something with, we were doing. It was a cre it was just a creative household. Where did Mark fall in that? Mark was definitely, he was always the one who was thinking about, okay, well, we could get Darth Vader's voice to sound more Vader-like if I kind of hacked this toy that we have to do this, and, you know, maybe we could film in this way, and, and I was always the one that was, like, writing the lines and, like, thinking about what music and effects and, and things like that, so it was, you know, it's fun when I look back on it because even our personalities and the job roles that we ended up having later on in life like were so defined even as middle school students making those videos. In what sense? I think, you know, for me, I've always just loved, you know, the, the act of being involved with the theater of putting, creating things and putting them out into the world in an artistic way and seeing everything around me as media. I've always seen everything, whether it was you know, a little camera that I could pick up or anything, everything's always been media. I think with Mark, he was always looking at the pieces of the puzzle around us and thinking like, how do I make these better? How do I connect things in an interesting way that people haven't done before? It's interesting because, I mean, and by the way, filming the doc at Facebook in the last, you just hear the word connect the world, the mission, connect, connect, <laughs> connect. Okay, so take me, I don't know if it was the water, whatever it was, this mission to connect, like how did this play into your childhood? Because that is definitely a mission you hear about nonstop at Facebook. <laughs> it's funny because um, I have to say, I didn't actually have that many outside friends growing up because when you have three brothers and sisters, when you have such a big family, you kind of have all of your companions built it into your family unit. Like I was just not wanting for that much outside right. companionship. So who knows, maybe after just spending his entire childhood growing up with three sisters, he's like, I just got to connect with other people. <laughs> he was ready for it. <laughs> it became his life mission to be like, I got to like meet other people. From <laughs> so tell me, and then you were the first in your family to go to Harvard. Was that your dream at the time? to go to Harvard? First of all, thank you for bringing up that I graduated from Harvard because, you know, that's like my score one in uh -huh. life, you know, that other Zuckerberg didn't graduate from right. there. The so Zuckerberg in front you. of me graduated from Harvard, for <laughs> the record. You. You know, that's, that's about it. That's about my only claim to fame. But stop. it was always my dream to go to Harvard. And I have to say that I think I was a very unlikely candidate to go there because I spent so much time working with the theater and singing growing up that I think people just didn't even want me to apply because they didn't want me to get my feelings hurt when I wasn't some like huge, uh, like perfect SAT scoring, student body president. But one of, I actually learned one of my most important life lessons applying to Harvard. They said, you know, we look for people who are well balanced and we look for people who are well lopsided. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the moment in life at around age 17 applying to college that I realized that it's totally okay to have a passion in life and really go for it and want to be excellent in it and that the world appreciates that. What did you study? I studied psychology. In actuality, I studied acapella. Uh -huh. I was in an acapella group. It was my entire life, the Harvard Opportunes. Uh -huh. And uh, Mark came to every single concert that we ever did. He was, you know, like right there. You know, that's something also about our family growing up is that my parents really instilled in us the value that we show up for one another. That, you know, even if it's not fun, even if you'd rather be doing something else with your time, if one of your brothers or sisters or someone in the family is doing a concert or getting honored, you go to it. And uh, I think that's, that's something that I didn't even really understand the importance of until I was much older with children of my own. So did Mark also want to go to, was it his dream also to go to Harvard? I am not even sure that it was Mark's dream to go to Harvard. He was at Phillips Exeter at the time and he spent so many of his weekends because Harvard was closer than going home. He spent so many of his weekends just coming and hanging out with me and my friends at Harvard that I think he was like, well, 
if I can get in, I might as well go here because I pretty much already am an honorary student here. Uh -huh. So um, I don't know if, if that was his dream or what, but... Um, he kind of followed in your footsteps. <laughs> I'll say it. It seems like he kind of followed in your footsteps. <laughs> the only thing I think people know about Mark in college, which we'll get to kind of a little bit later, is Jesse Eisenberg <laughs> and the social network. So like, <laughs> as his sister who actually spent time with him in college, what was he like in college? He was a normal kid. Like, I think, you know, we forget not that many people People are thrust into that level of a spotlight of corporate America at such a young age. And so, you know, I think the world has a view of him, but the view that I have of him is like kids playing beer pong, hanging out in college, like just doing really normal things that college kids do. And um, sometimes I feel sad for him that he doesn't get to, you know, have those moments or, you know, yeah. kind of missed out having the rest of the moments like that the rest of us get to have. They say when you turn famous, everything kind of stands still for a second, right? Like yeah. that person you become, it's harder to do the normal people things. Yeah. It's harder to have those moments. Do you mm -hmm. find that now? I definitely think so because the world wants you to be a certain way. I think there's so much emphasis on young leaders today to be the perfect role model because it seems like there's so much, there's so many people who are looking up to them and depending on them and looking to them to change the way the world is. And so it's almost like you, you know, you have no room to be a real person. Uh, that's why I treasure so many moments from our childhood and college so much because the mark I know is a real guy, a real brother, a real friend, you know, and, and that not many people have gotten to see that. Do you remember where you were when he told you he wanted to start this thing called Facebook, or mm. I think maybe the Facebook? I had graduated mm -hmm. um, when he started the Facebook. It's funny, again, you know, sometimes some of the best things that happen to you in life don't actually look that great in the right. beginning. My first job out of college, I worked for an ad agency called Ogilvy & Mather. And I remember I so desperately wanted to work there. And the only job that they had was in this brand new team called Digital Marketing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fine, I guess I'll take this like dead end job in digital marketing so I could get to what I really want to be doing with the celebrities and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, when I think back on it, like if I hadn't taken that job and gained that expertise and that skill set in digital marketing, mm -hmm. I would not have been ready for that phone call from Mark saying, hey, I'm, I'm working on this project and you know, I could really use some marketing advice. So he dropped out. You graduated. <laughs> Mark dropped out. Um, what did your parents say when, when he dropped out? You know, I think my parents definitely had mixed feelings about it. My dad, funny enough, right before each of us went to college, offered each of us the option of going to college or like investing in a franchise and running it. What? So he, yeah, he's like, do you want to go to college or do you want to buy a McDonald's franchise? Because he's like, you could either have a business or have your college education. So you decide what is more valuable to you in your life. So I actually think my parents were very progressive thinking about entrepreneurship a long time ago. I think most other kind of traditional Jewish parents would have panicked when Mark said he was starting a company. But I think they were like, okay, like you probably should have taken the McDonald's franchise money if you wanted a business, but like, oh, okay, this might be a, you know, a second good choice. I think that to my parents' credit, they really just were very open with a lot of us living my dreams. I mean, I told my parents that I wanted to be an actress and sing on Broadway. And they were kind of like, well, I don't know why you want to go to Harvard then. Do you want to just go to New York and, and try to do that? So I think, um, you know, they, they really wanted all of us to live our passion. That being said, I'm sure there's something in the back of their head where they're like, oh my gosh, my kid got into Harvard. He's dropping out. Like, this is the end of the universe. Take like a step back. Like, so you got the call. It was, it was a call or however it was. Mark decided at some point you should come join Facebook. Like, why, what was yeah. the thinking at the time? What... He, I hope, reading between the lines, that he was thinking was like, Randy, I'd really like if you would work with me. I think what came out of his mouth was more like, okay, I'll give you a job now. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I don't actually like, I'm not desperate for a job. I have a great job at Ogilvy and & Mather. And, um, and I was uh, doing some work at Forbes for, for some of their television shows at the time too. So at first I just kind of said no to him because I was like, that's not really a nice way to ask. And, um, and I have a great life in New York City. Why would I 
like go out to California and help you with your little project. Like I, I love my Is life. Is that kind of how you viewed it at the time? It was like this little project? Tell, because Mark was always working on these projects. Always. Our entire childhood is like just one project to the next. And so, you know, Facebook was so early. Who yeah. was I to think that that was going to be the thing that stuck? So I just thought, you know, all right, this is another one of Mark's projects. I'm living my best life as a 22 year old in New York City. There's no way that I'm gonna leave that and move out to the suburbs of California. Right. He was just like, Randy, I think if you just come out and see what we're working on, you'll change your mind. Mm -hmm. So I got on, I remember I got on a jet blue plane to California. I had never been to California before in my entire life. That was my first time there. Mm -hmm and he had arranged a car service to get me, which was so fancy. I'd never taken one before. Um, and it was just these guys in this house, and I just, I, I fell in love with their passion and what they were building, and they just, they really talked even at that early stage like they were gonna change the world. Tell me about the weekend. So what happened when you got in? Who was in the house? What happened? It was, um, I think there were about four or five guys in the house. There were a few people that were coming in and out. It was, I mean, super early stage, like, you know, like Sean Parker, Dustin, and kind of the, the original crew. And I remember, I think the moment that really changed my mind was we were sitting around and they were kind of thinking about the new logo and the new colors. And they looked at me and they were like, all right, Randy, you're the marketer. What do you think? About a decade of my career flashed before my eyes in that moment because I thought it would take me 10 years at Ogilvy & Mather to even be invited into a room making such a high level decision on a brand. Mm -hmm. And here I am 22 years old with the ability to be in a room and make big decisions and have my opinion matter. And I think that's, that's what really struck me about it because I had never had any exposure to anything entrepreneurial before. And I thought, oh my gosh, at such a young age, you know, I can own my successes and my failures. Like I can be part of big decisions. I don't even think I joined because I knew that Facebook was gonna be this huge successful company. We were the underdog for many years, but I just, I joined for, you know, the promise that I saw of having an entrepreneurial life. When Mark was developing Facebook at Harvard, or the Facebook, I guess it's called the Facebook at first. So <laughs> when Mark was developing Facebook, I know before there was like face mash and he got into a lot of trouble with the initial prototype. Do you remember where you, you were gone by then, but do you remember anything about this? I have to say I was very kind of vague, only vaguely aware of what was going on because I was, you know, in an entry level job at a major yeah. ad agency. So I was kind of, that was my full effort and focus at that time was like, I really need to, I was working, you know, 16 hours a day or something right. crazy. The one thing I do remember feeling though is I think a lot of people were just like, oh, thank goodness that someone made something where people's photos could be online because while I was at Harvard, you got a physical book that had everyone's names and photos in them. And if you didn't turn in a photo by the deadline, it was a bunny rabbit. So half the class was a photo of a bunny rabbit, which was completely not helpful because it was always like the guy you met at the party that you wanted to look up that was a bunny rabbit or something. And so I just remember thinking like, thank goodness that someone actually put that online. And like, of course it was Mark who did that, of course. Now, you know, he always was kind of a tinkerer, and so um, when I heard that he was under a little bit of fire, I was like, oh, Mark, like, you know, you kind of probably put that out there and didn't really think it through that well. But, I mean, he always saw a need for something, and his gut instinct was always like, let's get this out there and then make it perfect. That philosophy has really revolutionized a lot of the way that technology is made even today. Did he ever like make some grand statement to you or the family like I'm creating Facebook or you just, it, it was just something you kind of heard he was starting or just another project? I, to my knowledge and, and my fuzzy memory, especially after having two children, he walked up to the registrar's office and said, you know, this is really bad that the internet is upon us and yet we still have these books with half bunny rabbits in them. So he's like, can I help you and volunteer as a student to digitize this? And they just said no. They said no, it's fine. These books are fine. There's no need to digitize that. And I think 
it was almost a little bit of like, well, maybe you just don't get what I mean, so let me just go home and do it and show you. Like, I don't think it was an act of defiance. I don't think it was like, a, let me, you know, do something controversial. I think he always just had these thoughts of, this is a problem that I'm identifying. And like, if you, d like, I'm willing to fix it for you. Like, I, I want to meet that person who said no and give them a hug because if they had, you know, had the, the business foresight to say yes, like none of this would have ever been created. Funny. And you talked about, they showed you this logo and they asked your advice on it. Uh, just what did the logo look like? Well, uh, what was your advice? I remember we were in the stage of changing from the Facebook to Facebook. Right. I just remember so clearly though, that moment that they turned to me and asked my opinion. Mm. It really almost, it summed up, it brought into focus my entire childhood. And I think a lot of what we struggle with, with getting girls into entrepreneurship. And it made me realize in that moment that my entire childhood, people had always told me, you know, Randy, you could have any job you want. But, and I think they thought they were being very empowering, but not one person in my life ever told me I could create any job I wanted. Hmm. And probably people told that to Mark 20 times by the time he was 10 years old, that he could create anything he wanted. But no one ever said that to me. So I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur or an inventor or someone whose ideas mattered. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the, you know, the first moment in my professional life that I really like, could envision a world where my entrepreneurial ideas mattered. I read a little tidbit about your first salary and contract negotiation with <laughs> your brother, Mark. How did that go? That, you know, we negotiated my salary on a napkin in this tiny office above a Chinese restaurant in Palo Alto. I would not recommend to other people who are working for a family business or really in any business that you negotiate your salary on a napkin, but that's how it is. It makes a great story. And so his initial proposal that he wrote out was like this tiny salary with like a good amount of stock options. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about stock options. Again, I was like 22 right. years old. I was working in an ad agency for, you know, pennies. I didn't know anything about stock. All I saw was the opportunity to make more money than the tiny amount I was making. So I remember I crossed out the stock options and like doubled the salary. And I was like, no, that's what I want. And he crossed it out again, wrote his initial offer again and just said, trust me and pushed the napkin back across the table. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna trust you. And uh, you know, now I look back on that and I was like, wow, he really took care of me in that moment and really valued me more than I was valuing myself. And I'm, I'm assuming that was, that was certainly a good option looking down the road, looking at how much Facebook is worth now. Totally. That being said, uh, I do wanna say though that that offer on that napkin was totally in line with what other people were making yeah. at the moment. Um, it was always very important to both me and to Mark that there was never any special treatment that, because, you know, I, I thought I was a Harvard grad. I had a great career yeah. ahead of me. I, you know, it was not my intention to just go be someone's sister. I never saw with my life that I would ever be defined by a man. Uh, in my career, in my life. And so, you know, it was very important to me, even at that moment, negotiating the salary on the napkin, that from that moment on, being an employee at Facebook, that I was very equal and in line with other people in my position. Well, how was he as a boss? I think the smartest decision that he ever made was that he was never my direct boss, right. ever. Like, so my performance always had to stand on its own at the company because I always was reporting into other people with specific deliverables, knowing, you know, like if I'm not doing my job, like that person can fire me, right. you know? It's not like I'm going in, hey, hey bro, you know, what's, what's going on at the company? Um, and so I think that was an incredibly mature decision considering we were, you know, 21 and 23 years old at that time to really have the foresight to set up a relationship of siblings working together that was set up for success. What was the office like then? I think people forget how young you guys were, but what was it like then? We were so young. I mean, if you, I don't think that was the kind of office that you'd walk into and you'd think like, this is going to be a multi hundred billion dollar company. Right. Like it looked like it was a bunch of kids. But I think what was so great about that is that none of us had any ideas of how the world was supposed to work, 
how business was supposed to work. And so we were just able to be really free and dream up, you know, what we wanted, the, the world we wanted to create. But it was just this incredibly fun dynamic of people who were just working around the clock and your colleagues were your friends and everyone was going out. So I basically, Facebook was my life for about you know, seven straight years. I was there the day we launched Newsfeed. I remember that people just went up in arms. Newsfeed, launching Newsfeed was hands down the biggest new feature we had ever rolled out to the user base. And, uh, you know, and we just almost did a complete revamp of the site in one day. So people panicked a little bit. The site that they loved just completely changed overnight. Think about that moment with you guys sneaking out and like newsfeed and like this whole drama at the company, but you guys launching newsfeed. I mean, how do you feel when you see like Arab Spring came about because of newsfeed? I mean, or, you know, was fueled by, by this platform. What is it like for you thinking on some of these more historical events that have happened because of that thing that people were pressing, you know, getting, <laughs> joining these groups and protesting about? I mean, I have to say that some of those moments, like, the group that started No Mas Fark in Colombia, that was protesting the violence in Colombia, Arab Spring, some of what we saw with elections going on around the world, like those are the moments that you wake up when you work in technology and you're like, this is why I get up in the morning. Like I get up in the morning and I work for 20 hours a day so that I can empower someone across the world who doesn't even know me to have a voice. Hmm. And I, I mean, I just remember seeing what was going on in Arab Spring and just feeling so lucky and so excited to be a tiny, minuscule part of what was happening there. At the same time, though, you don't empower that without empowering other people. And so there's always, you know, a catch-22 whenever you're giving a voice to people who didn't have a voice before. So we know what the world thought. What was happening inside Facebook? What, did, what were people saying? What was Mark saying Like when, when this was all going down? What people don't realize is that we had been testing Newsfeed out internally for weeks right. ahead of that. So as employees of the company, we had all gotten very used to a world where newsfeed was your home screen on Facebook. Right. So by the time we rolled it out to all of the users, we thought, oh, you know, they're just going to love this the same way we've grown to love it. And we, I guess we forgot the shock, the initial shock factor. Yeah. One funny story I do remember is that the day that we rolled out newsfeed just to the employees, two employees who had been in a relationship with each other broke up that day. And I guess they went to their computers, thought that they were stealthily changing their status to single, and then that was the first thing that popped up on every single person's newsfeed in the company, was that like, these people were no longer in a relationship. And uh, that was the moment that I was like, this is a really powerful tool. This, like, people, this is gonna be amazing. Like, no one is ever going to miss an important moment of their friends' and family's lives, ever. But it was also, you know, I think in that moment we really witnessed, like, the sheer power of, of what happens. Um, and, you know, that being said, I think we probably could have taken other measures to roll it out in a slower way to the users, that wasn't as shocking. With the breakup thing, weren't you guys like, oh, we should put like, is this like the beginning of privacy at Facebook where you're like, <laughs> wait a second, like maybe not everyone wants to see this, right? Like, it's so powerful. And I think it, even like seeing like how it, you saw the power of it with young people dating, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was, that was definitely, I, I think the first moment that I truly witnessed how powerful Facebook was, mm -hmm. but up until that moment, if you wanted to know anything about your friends, you had to actually go to each of their profiles right. individually, look at what they had posted, you know, or call them, text them, you know, AOL Instant Messenger, I guess. And suddenly, in one moment, this important thing that had happened in these people's lives, everyone knew about. And we were like, this is powerful and scary and efficient and amazing all at the same time. How do the people feel when they're, like, what did they say? We're like, oh my God, this is powerful, but oh my God, I'm they're embarrassed. They're just like, wow, we picked the wrong day to break up. Right. But people, uh, I mean, 
the user base revolted with the newsfeed. They, you know, we completely changed the site. They didn't understand what was being shared with other people. I remember we had to sneak out the back entrance for several days. Um, the ironic thing, though, is that all of these people were joining these groups on Facebook that were protesting newsfeed. But the only reason that they even found out those groups existed was because the group surfaced in newsfeed. Like they would not have even known that those protest groups existed. So we were like, oh my gosh, they are using our product to protest our product. Like, I don't know if this is a sign that you've really made it or like we have to really rethink our strategy, but they're using it. <laughs> you, I don't think a, pe a lot of people know this about you, but you really helped with media at Facebook and content. Tell me, take us into the room where you guys were thinking of this. Sure, I always lived in this world where I thought that you know Facebook could be the biggest media company on earth, even when we were just this, this tiny little company. Um, and so I was always trying to think of ways to use our product to create content and to have media. Um, I remember coming up with the first ever like back to school center on mm -hmm. Facebook when we had you know two sales reps and a tiny team and we were, and it was but that was like a big deal that we launched that and we brought all these brands into kind of this curated experience and I remember just like sketching that on a, on a piece of computer paper wow. and, and taking that to the sales team and I just I started growing so passionate when uh, especially the iPhone came out about thinking every single person is a media company and I could just so clearly envision a world where every single person was a television network, every person was a movie studio, and how we could do that inside of Facebook. Wow, and, and so, I mean, and that came in many different forms. And by the way, that has never been a more powerful statement than if you think about Facebook now. Every year we hosted a developer conference called F8. And uh, we'd gather all of the developers around the world that built things on top of the Facebook platform and bring them together. And one year in particular, I think it was 2010, there was a huge volcano that erupted in Europe and none of the, it was some Icelandic volcano that I can't even try to pronounce the name of, but none of our European developers could make it. They grounded all flights in Europe. And this was the day before the conference and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna take on this huge feat. I wanna live stream the entire conference. And not only do I wanna live stream it, but I'm actually going to take a microphone the entire time and talk to the developers that can't make it and kind of be their conduit between what's happening on stage at this conference and them feeling disappointed at home. Yeah. And it was so powerful. We had something like 110,000 people tune into that broadcast. Yeah. We were only missing about like 500 attendees, right? So 110,000 people tuned in to watch a super technical developer conference via this live stream. And I thought, wow, this is like, this is the next frontier of media. So when did you guys actually launch it or what was that like? Even though I had such great proof points yeah. from doing F8 Live, you know, I tried to pitch it to a lot of media companies. They didn't really see the value. CNN was the first company that I really worked with that made live streaming with Facebook mm -hmm. such a, a big reality. We live streamed uh, President Obama's inauguration on Facebook, simultaneous coverage on CNN. Today, that doesn't seem like a big idea, right? That seems like, of course, we're live streaming everything, but at that moment, that was, I think, the biggest live stream that had ever been done in history. It was the most ambitious, certainly, and we allowed people all over the world to comment and talk in real time. So that, I think, was a moment that really people sat up and realized the potential of these platforms to be a media company. About two days before the broadcast, one of the uh, producers called me and said, you know, Randy, we really want an on-camera spokesperson inside Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, preferably someone who's really relatable, preferably someone with the last name Zuckerberg. <laughs> like, do you want to, you know, be our on-camera anchor? person mm -hmm. from inside Facebook and so I, I mean I think I got up at two o'clock in the morning and was like getting hair and makeup and learning how to hold a microphone so I don't even think I got to really fully appreciate what we had yeah. pulled off that day because I was so in it but I do remember sitting at an all-hands company meeting and Chris Cox standing up and saying you know 
will the team who led the Obama live stream please stand up and just be recognized by the entire company because you guys changed the face of media today. And I just remember standing up and it was really the first project that I had spearheaded inside Facebook and just like really thinking about this new world that was about to come. No doubt it did change it. I Did you guys ever have those conversations of how Facebook Live could be abused? Because you saw the power of it and then there was the time, and I know this being in media, where people started committing suicide on Facebook Live. So what were the conversations like then? I mean, this is so, I mean, these two, conversations were so far apart because for that President Obama live stream, I mean, the bandwidth power was not even close to being there for people to be streaming individually on their phones. I mean, we parked six satellite trucks outside the Facebook office in order to pull that off. You know, the idea that I had in the back of my mind of everyone with their phones filming was so far down the road. I think we were very young and idealistic at the time that we were creating these. I think for me, I was just thinking, you know, how do we do something groundbreaking right now in this moment? I remember thinking, oh my gosh, we have given a voice to everyone and just waking up and feeling so excited about that. It really wasn't until years later with a lot that I see going on in the world that I woke up and was like, oh my gosh, we've given a voice to everyone. Right, I mean, it certainly <laughs> seems like that's the phase of the company that, that they're at, where they're realizing yeah. you did it, right? You succeeded, there's two billion people and everyone has right. a voice. And so I think, you know, a lot of these, these tools that were created, um, you know, were created with such incredible intentions of really just giving a voice to everyone, putting power in everyone's hands, you know, democratizing media and content. Um, you know, of course, what we realized is that any time that you put a tool out into the world, there's going to be people that use it for incredible good. And there's going to be people that, you know, really use it for incredible bad. And I mean, I guess you just have to decide, is it worth it? to put a new platform out into the world. I still believe the answer is yes when I see everything that has happened, but of course it's you know very, very complicated. What potential did you see for Facebook and uh, potential in elections? One of the beautiful things about Facebook is that if you saw an opportunity in the market or something that you wanted to do, you raised your hand and then all of a sudden you were the one running it, mm -hmm. mostly. You know, that's what happens in a startup. And for me, so I was leading a lot of our marketing efforts at that time and I still saw that in the United States, we were struggling to be taken seriously as more than a college platform. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, here comes the 2008 election. And I thought, oh my gosh, this could actually be a moment where people could take our site seriously. Mm -hmm. We could actually enable real discourse about what's going on in this election year. I mean, that was such a huge turning point for the site because we had, you know, you had Obama, you had Hillary Clinton, you had this just incredibly unexpected, unpredictable election that happened that year. And um, all of a sudden, people started using Facebook as a way to talk about their views and talk about issues and debate one another. Could I have anticipated in 2007 how people would be using Facebook for elections 10 years down the pipe? Probably not. but. Um, what I did see suddenly was that the world opened their eyes and realized that this was not just a site for college students. A lot of this story of Facebook was, was shown to, the, to everyone in a Hollywood film, uh, <laughs> yeah. The Social Network. Um, when did you first hear about the movie? Or take, take me to that. I started hearing rumblings of the movie pretty early because again, I was working on the marketing team yeah. and I guess um, the movie studio had to get some clearances run by our press and marketing team in order to, to do certain yeah. things. Now, they were very creative, the movie studio. They walked you know, exactly the line of doing you know, just what they didn't have to get approvals to do, but not mm -hmm. anymore. But, that being said, you know, I definitely saw a lot of things with the movie um, ahead of time. I had very mixed feelings about the movie because on one hand, it's really challenging to see a sibling or a loved one portrayed in a way that's just so unrealistic to what you know. 
they famously did not allow the actors to meet the people in real life that they were playing because they didn't want real life to affect a good story. So, you know, Jesse Eisenberg never met my brother. Did your brother want to meet Jesse? I, you know, I'm sure he did, but I mean, we, I certainly wanted Mark to meet Jesse so that Jesse could really see the full breadth and depth of who he was playing, but that never happened. And so, you know, it was, it's, it was definitely challenging to see a movie knowing the whole world was going to see it and seeing, you know, a portrayal that was so different. That being said, though, it was some of the best free marketing we ever could have asked for. So as a marketer, I have to say that it was just this incredible moment. I mean, that's every startup company's dream mm -hmm. is to be in a mode of rapid growth and expansion and have someone else pay the budget for a Hollywood blockbuster film to be made about your company was just incredible free marketing. I decided to own it. I walked the red carpet of the Golden Globes that year. Um, and uh, the entire cast of The Social Network was like, we really want to meet you, <laughs> uh, which was just a, a fun moment for me. But definitely, still to this day, you know, some raw mixed emotions about that movie. It's funny that you say that because everyone we talk to at Facebook, and, and I'll, if we chat with Mark, I'll ask him about this. Everyone seems to just like, the movie. Like, Facebook's been through a lot in the last couple of years, and it's like, it's like you like, gotta like, delicately dance around like the movie, like, because it's so sensitive. Um, I get the sense that it really impacted folks there. They felt that it was unfair. Like, what did they get wrong? I think, I mean, they de I think they just got a lot of the intentions wrong. Um, I mean, they really painted Mark as this character who is like, you know, I just want to, like, get girls, so I'm going to build this thing, and, like, I don't really care about, you know, anyone in my life or anyone in my circle. And... That's not what any of us saw. We were a tiny company at that time, maybe 150 employees at most. We were a family, you know? I mean, we were just going through all of this together. We were all so close. And so to see someone who you consider a part of your family and who was actually a part of my family portrayed in that way, that it, we almost felt like it was unfair. It's like when someone bullies your sibling on the playground and you're like, wait, I'm allowed to bully my sibling, but nobody else can. Like, I think that's how we all felt a little bit. So, like, Mark didn't just want to get girls. No, he, I mean, he really wanted to create things. I think that's something that he and I have always shared in common. You know, for me, my creative outlet has always been the arts and theater. But both of us, our entire childhood, have just, all we wanted out of life was to put new things in the world that didn't exist before we were there. So I think... For a while, people were dancing around the film. Should we even acknowledge that this is coming out? Should we just pretend that it doesn't exist, that we are living in our little bubble where there's not a giant Hollywood blockbuster about our company and we'll just like, you know, no one's going to talk about it? And then I think at the last minute, we just decided, no, let's own this. Like, this movie is happening. So we rented out a theater. We... As a, I think it was multiple theaters, actually, that we had to rent out. We went as a whole company. I remember everyone got a map because it said, all right, first, we're going to go see the movie, and then we're going to go to this bar down the street, and then at, like, 10 o'clock, we're going to go to this other bar, and there was a map of how to walk around downtown Palo Alto that night. And it turned what I think would have been a really uncomfortable situation into the office into one of the most fun nights of company bonding that we had. Tell me about that time with Mark, like, during that. I always wore two hats in the company, both, you know, as kind of, I've always felt like I've been a, you know, protective older sister and a marketer. Yeah. So I think for me, you know, I was always wearing two hats of like, okay, like, don't feel bad about this movie. You know, it's, you know, you're never as good as people say you are. You're never as bad as people say you are. Right. Like, just let them do it. And then the other part of me that was like, this is gold, this yeah. is amazing, you know, wow, all this, you know, incredible free publicity and marketing that we're getting as a company. Did you ever say, did you say that to him? Did he confide in you during that time? I, we definitely talked about it a lot. And, you know, I think we were at a really pivotal point in the company where, we were starting to grow in a big way, but a lot of people, especially in the middle of the country, hadn't really heard about Facebook yet. There was still so much room for growth in the United States. And, you know, I don't know if it was just the movie or a lot of other factors that happened around that time, but that was a time of huge growth 
for our company inside the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, even if um, it had to paint Mark in a, in a more negative light than any of us would have hoped, at least what it did was make people feel curious about Facebook mm -hmm. and want to understand a little more what was going on and try it out. But I actually think the most pivotal moment in the early days of Facebook was turning down the offer to be bought by Yahoo. That was a moment, I think, that a lot of employees felt like, oh my gosh, we missed this easy payday. But at the same time, I remember we all looked at each other and we were like, wow, we're in this for the long run together, aren't we? Like, this is not a leader who is just gonna take his first opportunity to cash out. Like, this is a leader who wants to build something that's gonna last. And like, how lucky are all of, are all of us to be part of something in the long run. So that I think was a more pivotal moment even than, than any of the launches that we had. I remember that was such a big deal that he turned that down. Yeah. I take me into the feeling of the company because were some people questioning him as a leader after turning down a, a billion dollar offer, what at that time was just unfathomable? I was actually shocked at how supportive everyone was in the company because I am sure that there were several people at that stage who that would have been a life-changing amount of money for them to walk away from the company with at that point. It would have been so easy for Mark to say, okay, I worked on this project for you know a year or two. I could walk away from this with hundreds of millions of dollars and just go create you know the eight next things that I want to build. And I honestly think that it was a combination of him like looking out for the people that were working for him and just this drive to create and not be driven by money that, that hadn't turned down. I think we all saw that. And I think, you know, we, we really, that was the moment to me that his leadership really shone through. Talk to me about when Cheryl came on board. Um, you know, what, what was that like for the company? It was an incredible moment when Cheryl came on board. I think I remember sending her an email that was like, you don't know who I am, but I am just so thankful that there is a senior woman like you who's coming into this company right now. You know, I think up until that moment, it was it was a great place to work. It was fun. You know, I, the work we were doing was really rewarding, but it was definitely like every other Silicon Valley company, like very few women in the room. Um, and there was something I remember about Cheryl joining that just made me feel like, okay, like as women in Silicon Valley and tech, we matter because if a woman like Cheryl can come in as a COO at that mm -hmm. role, then, you know, there's something that all of us can aspire to. Do you remember what she wrote you back? I saw her the next day. She hosted kind of an all hands where she introduced herself. And um, I came up to her and I'm like, hey, I'm Randy. I wrote you an email. And she's like, no, I know. I got your email. I'm really excited to work together. And I, you know, I was so lucky to, to work closely alongside of her and learn so much from her. So why the decision? Um, you eventually decided to leave. Did you get the sense you were getting intertwined with your brother? Was it that Facebook was growing up and you couldn't have as much of a voice? What was the reason that you decided oh to leave? Gosh. Over the years, as I've tried to distill exactly what it was that led me to, to do that, there are definitely, I think, a few things that really stand out to me. I, I always felt very complicated about gender roles in Silicon Valley. I loved what I did at Facebook. I loved working for the company. I hated being the only woman in almost every room that I was in for 10 straight years. And I always thought, you know, gosh, I want to be part of the solution, not continue to be part of the problem. So I think maybe I need to step outside of Silicon Valley and really understand where we're losing women and where we're losing girls in this funnel. I think I also had a very complicated relationship with the growing digital divide that I was seeing. Mm. Here I was sitting in Palo Alto, California, you know, right before my eyes, witnessing one of the biggest wealth creation events in the history of our country. And then you need only drive seven minutes to East Palo Alto to see a city that doesn't, didn't have reliable Wi-Fi access, couldn't sustain a grocery store, like had just such a huge crime rate. And it just made me think, you know, wow, we're putting all this focus on one geographic area of the country and putting all of this money and all of this opportunity and access. But what about everyone else? Yeah. What about the rest of the country who, 
is equally as smart and talented and just has no opportunity and access. So I think a lot of those things caught up. Um, the final thing I will say that you know, we've definitely touched on is that for me, I definitely woke up one day and said, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong movie of my life. Hmm. You know, I thought, I was like, I'm supposed to be the star of the movie of my life. How am I the supporting character in my own life? <laughs> to this day, I'm just so thankful and honored that I had the opportunity to join Mark and be part of Facebook and, and do that. But, you know, that it's his vision. It's his company. All of my work was in, in support of, of his vision. And at some point, I just, you know, I really wanted to create something for myself. What was it like when you told him you were leaving? What did he say to you? It was definitely a tough moment um, to tell him that I wanted to leave. But that being said, you know, it wasn't like I was there for a few months and then I, you know, flaked out and went back. I mean, I was there for many years at the company. I was there longer than a lot of the other early employees. Um, I was also pregnant at that time with my first son. And I think even during my pregnancy, I wanted so badly to show everyone that, you know, that I wasn't gonna phone it in, that I traveled to something like 17 different countries yeah. while I was pregnant and worked up until the day before I gave birth. And so I think I was just at a place where when I picked up the phone and I told Mark that I was leaving, he was like, you know what, I'm disappointed, but like, thank you for your contribution. You started looking at this complicated relationship with technology and humanity, which has quickly become one of the most important stories of our generation. But um, why then? What, you know, you started creating this content about yeah. the complications of technology. What did your role at Facebook do to, to kind of bolster the interest in, in looking at kind of the other end of this type of thing? I think one of the big things that I saw at Facebook is that when you give a voice to everyone, you don't get to choose who you give a voice to. You give a voice to people you agree with, and you give a voice to people you disagree with. You give a voice to people who are gonna use it well. You give a voice to people who are going to use it to say you know, hateful things. And, um, and you don't get to choose. And that was something that I always struggled with because I thought, you know, I am glad that we are giving everyone a voice, but at the same time, it is difficult to see people who you fundamentally disagree with now have a big voice. When I left Facebook, uh, there were a lot of publishers that asked me to write you know, a tell-all about what it was like on the inside of Facebook and working with my brother, and that was, just, that was not something I was at all interested in doing. So I went back out with a counter pitch and I said, you know, I'm not gonna write that book, but I do really wanna write a book about kind of the complicated relationship we now all have with tech. The idea that we're kind of too tethered to our devices, that we need to unplug, and that tech has some great things about it and some challenging things. No one wanted that book. They, they just wanted a tell-all. Um, and then there was a front page article uh, that I remember about unplugging. And all of a sudden, all of the publishers came back to me and they were like, wait, maybe people are actually interested in the complicated relationship with tech. Like maybe you should write your book dot complicated after all. That's interesting. I know I was looking through and it's like you said, uh, what did it, you were talking about the perils of social media. That's like 2011. By the way, yeah. anyone can talk about the perils of social media now, but 2011 was a long time ago and you were saying the world doesn't need another hashtag sunset. <laughs> and your book, you quote Chris Rock, who says you only live once, so make sure you spend 15 hours a day on the internet. Desperately <laughs> seeking the validation of strangers. Right, you were on, but like Randy, you were on to something that we're all talking about, that we're all being hard on Facebook, rightfully so, you know, talking about, wait a second, what did this platform, which connected the world and did so many great things, like also has led to like me looking through everyone's fake fabulous lives on Facebook and feeling kind of bad about myself. Like you were having these thoughts all the way back in 2011. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it is very in vogue right now to hate on technology. Yeah. Because I came to Facebook as a non-technical person, mm -hmm. I've always felt that the best role that I could play inside the company was being kind of the voice of the world. And I've always tried to look at tech in a balanced viewpoint. I've always tried to look at 
the products that we were launching and see both the good and the challenging things about them. So when I started to write about that, you know, no one wanted to pay <laughs> attention to it in 2011, but it's something that I've now been talking about and researching for years. I always viewed you, and I, I know that you had struggles with people looking at you as like another Zuckerberg or this that, but I, you know, knowing all the stuff you did at the company, knowing the stuff you do now, I always did kind of view you as the voice within the company of what the world is looking at. You were with a bunch of engineers and you were talking about humanity. I spent hours every day, you know, on a microphone seeing what other people right. were saying in the world. And, you know, it's easy to drink the Kool-Aid when you live in Silicon Valley. But, you know, I was lucky to spend enough time traveling the world and talking to other people that I realized, like, hold on, guys. Like, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily want to be so disrupted. So, like, let's, let's tread lightly. Do you think that Facebook lost that sense of humanity in the last couple of years? It's a tough question. Um, you know, I think that when you become so big and you have so many people that are using your service, really in some ways you just become, you know, an outlet of what's going on in the world and a reflection, a mirror of what's happening in the world. And a lot of the sentiments, a lot of the things that you see happening on Facebook, like these are real things that are being said out in the world. If Facebook didn't exist, people would still be saying these things that are hurtful and we'd still you know, be in this really tense political time in the world. It's just that now information travels so much faster and further than ever before that you know, it feels like we wouldn't have heard about it. How did you feel as a former employee and as a sister of Mark when you started hearing about election interference and also Cambridge Analytica? I have to say at that moment, I felt very glad that I had been talking about the complicated role of technology for five or six years to that point because I was like, okay, thank goodness this is something that, that I've been talking about for a long time up until then. Um, you know, I have always thought that one of the difficult things about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley and the culture that we have now of turning profits and having huge valuations so quickly is that we don't give leaders and founders enough room to think about what's gonna happen because of their decisions 10 years down the, the pipe. What goes through your head watching him, watching your brother testify yeah. before Congress? There were so many feelings that I had. I mean, first of all, I was so proud of him. I thought he did so well. I thought he had so much poise. Um, I felt embarrassed for our political leaders, to be totally honest, about you know the kind of lack of understanding of technology that they showed in their questions. But I think also for me, I have just a broader confusion about you know kind of the role that we seem to be demanding of technology and tech companies in general. Because in this country, we have never put the onus on private companies to protect us. Never. We have never put the onus on private companies to save our environment. We've like allowed them to get away with terrible things. We have never put the onus on private companies to like make us be healthy and have better lives. But yet we suddenly live in this world where all of a sudden it seems like the world is demanding technology companies to like save us. Yeah. And I, these are still just private companies that are that are developing their products and beholden to their shareholders. So I think we're at this weird inflection point in our own country where we really need to think about the role that companies have in policing things and making decisions and the role that our government has. It was a moment in my career because like everybody was watching. It was like tech went yeah. mainstream because like people I hadn't heard of like f heard from since high school were messaging me when I interviewed Mark because everyone cared so totally. deeply. It is kind of this surreal thing because on one hand you know the reason that he's there testifying is, you know, not great. On the other hand, you know, could you even imagine as parents or a sister in your wildest dreams that a family member of yours would like do something so important that aspects of it are being heard on a, a national and international scale of that magnitude? So there's almost this sense of, you know, like 
bewilderment, honestly, in almost everything that continues to happen. You normally don't weigh in on Facebook issues anymore because you are long gone and you're doing your own thing um, and, and having an important voice on some of these other, the other side of things. But Facebook's role in, in policing speech and content is something that's, that's interesting. Mm. And um, I know Mark came under fire recently for the Holocaust denial comment. Um, mm. And I, you decided to weigh in. Um, he struggled with putting it into words. He, you know, what, tell, talk to us because I feel like you're good at putting these into words. What was complicated about it? Some people just see it as a no brainer, like mm. take down that content. Um, yeah. Why do you think he couldn't just say that or do that? You know, I first got my in introduction to how complicated this topic was going to be back in, I think, 2009. I got invited to represent Facebook at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And at that same year, I had one of my best career moments in Facebook and one of my lowest career moments. I, you know, we had, it was right around the time of Arab Spring, and I think the minister of Tunisia rejected the BBC, rejected all of these news outs, outlets because he wanted to talk to people directly on Facebook. Right. And that was this moment that I was like, oh my gosh, everything that I've been working for is, is happening. And then later that day, I sat in a room with all of these religious leaders from around the world and they called on me in the back of the room and they said, Randy, can you come to the front for a second? We'd like to talk to you about all these pages we found on Facebook where, you know, F Christianity, F Judaism, F. and I just, you know, I sat there and I was like, wow, this is going to be the issue of our time because it is impossible to provide that megaphone for the minister of Tunisia without also providing the megaphone for people to say things that are upsetting these religious leaders. Hmm. And I just thought, you know, here I am one young person working with a lot of other young people, like trying to make this, these difficult calls on what's worth it. Is it worth it to give the voice over here if it also means over here? I knew that that was going to be something that was going to really be an issue for the company for a long time. One of the stances that we have always taken at Facebook, and I keep, I use the royal we, even though I'm not at the company anymore, um, is that, it is worth it to give the voice to everyone, even if it means giving a voice to people you disagree with. It's difficult, it's challenging, sometimes it makes you angry to the core when you see who has been given a megaphone, but the view of the company and you know, of me also is that it is far better to live in a world where people are free to say what they want than to live in a world where they're not. When you were specifically talking about the Holocaust denial, you said something uh, really interesting in this post that you wrote. You said, while it can be appalling to see what some people say, I don't think living in a sterile Stepford-like online community where we simply press the delete button on the ugly reality of how people feel is helpful either. Mm -hmm. So when I sat in that room with those religious leaders and they asked me why these groups are on Facebook, what I said to them was that, you know, Facebook isn't creating these opinions. People feel this way, whether they're on Facebook or not. Is there any way that we could view this as an opportunity that it's bringing these people to the surface in order for us to foster dialogue and conversation with? And I think that's kind of a constant push and pull when we're seeing people posting things that we vehemently disagree with is that, you know, we have to remind ourselves these people would be feeling this way even without this outlet. Even if this outlet policed them and censored them, they would still feel those feelings. They would find somewhere else to express them. And so I do believe it is better to live in a world where we at least see the reality of how people feel so we understand the world we live in rather than just sterilize everything and live in a world that we think is perfect and those feelings are bubbling up under the surface. Is there any specific way um, he deals with the pressure? He's a dad now, which is, you know, he has a lot to focus on at home. Um, I think people also forget just the incredible impact philanthropically that he's made in the world too. I remember I was just in San Francisco with my seven-year-old son and we saw a sign for, you know, like the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And like my seven-year-old was so proud 
you know? And he was like, I want to take a photo next to this and, and send it to Uncle Mark. And, you know, like this is so cool. And um, I think it's really easy to, to focus on just the story of the moment and miss the fuller picture of who a person is. I mean, he, like, let's not forget, this is someone who committed 99% of his wealth to philanthropy and who has inspired now so many other entrepreneurs to give while they're young instead of waiting. So, you know, I, for me, when I see the news, I just, I really wish that people would step back and see the bigger picture. And what do you think folks get wrong? I think people get wrong that Mark is like this mercenary figure who's selling out people's data for money. It has never been about the money for him. Never. If it was about the money, he would have cashed out when Yahoo offered a billion dollars over a decade ago and walked, right? We wouldn't be having any of this. So, you know, it's not, it certainly wasn't about the money when he pledged to give 99% of his net worth away to philanthropy and to a foundation. So he, the decisions he is making are not driven by money. They are not mercenary decisions. And so that's where I think people get it wrong because I think people have this view of him making these decisions and kind of like laughing Scrooge McDuck with his money. And um, I truly believe that every decision he makes is, you know, he believes is in service to the world. So what is it like to be a Zuckerberg. The name definitely carries weight. I definitely feel like um, sometimes when I weigh in on issues that I need to really make sure I'm very thoughtful about it because it's not just my own opinion that I stand for. It's, mm. you know, the opinion of, of Mark and Facebook and the internet. You brought in a lot of different types of culture to Facebook. So <laughs> take me back to the day you guys are it, you know, it's a lot of folks in their early 20s, like, what was the culture like and, you know, what were you guys doing? I think, you know, people have this misconception when you work in tech that people are kind of like these soulless robots at a computer, but, like, Facebook was such a fun place to work in the early days. I like to think, you know, that I was, you know, one of, I brought a little bit of, like, the New York fun and, yeah. and spirit out to Silicon Valley. So we did things like, you know, we had color war on staff um, where we like divided everyone into teams and we played sports. We had Facebook Idol where everyone like did a music competition. Um, our band won. We made an Evanescence cover band that we called Evanescence Essence. Like Evanescence has two songs and we play both of them. But there was this really fun spirit because we had companies like Google, 10 minutes up the road from us, Yahoo, 10 minutes away from us. Those companies had endless resources. I know it's hard to imagine, you know, remember a day when Facebook had no resources and wasn't this huge behemoth company, but my first year of doing marketing at Facebook, the only budget I had was one box of t-shirts. That's it, for a year. How do you compete with companies like Google and Yahoo that are in your back door that have chefs on site and volleyball courts and masseuses? Like the only way you can compete is by having one of the most fun places to work that people wanna go. It's just funny thinking about it because yeah, you're right, like all of these companies and I'm sure it was like, people trying to steal engineers and this and that, like back in the day. And like, you guys were just like, it's hard to think of Facebook as this like scrappy little place. Like, and you guys, were you, did people drink in the office? Was there beer? Did it feel like a frat house? Was it more like karaoke parties? Like take me into a party early in the, in the early days of Facebook or? I think like most of it was pretty good, clean fun. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, like we were as cool as we thought we were. Like we were actually all computer nerds, mm -hmm. but like, Facebook game day is one of my most fun memories. You know, we would all just kind of like divide into teams and have spirit and like go, get away from the office, like doing, you know, all of like the Facebook talent shows and the little things that we did were so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, people, they think of Facebook as it is today, this huge global public company. 
and they forget what it was like when we were 50 people in a little office with you know not much budget and not that many resources and like all we had was our own creativity in order to attract the best talent from around the world. A lot of these things that you've touched on in this interview, right? Kind of being the only woman in a room sometimes or looking at a complicated relationship with technology. I don't know if a lot of folks know like that is kind of what you've devoted your life to now. So we heard a lot about Mark and we heard a lot about Randy in those Facebook years. Um, you left to go kind of create your own media company and content content company. What are you doing now? What's kind of the priority now? I think, you know, my experience in Silicon Valley just completely changed and shaped my life in so many ways. Um, one of the things that I did realize, though, is that I desperately wanted to see a world where there was more representation from women in the room. And I couldn't understand why after 15 years, it's changed so little to be totally honest. I mean, even to this day, my best advice for young women in tech is to have a man's name like Randy because I can't even tell you how many meetings I got in those early days of Facebook because people thought that they were meeting with a dude. And then I'd show up and hmm. I'd be like, they're, they're, where's Randy? And I'm like, well, sucker, sorry. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's funny and it's horrible, right, that that's still my best advice. So for me, um, after just the, inc I mean, I feel so incredibly lucky with what has happened Facebook financially in my life. And I just feel like, well, it is my life mission to use the luck that I had and hold the door open for other women. Now, the thing that shocked me though in my research is that here I thought that I was either gonna go create media content for women or an educational platform or fund female startups. But my research showed me that it is nine years old that we lose girls in tech. That is around third grade that girls say, I'm not good at math and science, that's for boys. So I found myself after Facebook starting a children's entertainment and media company. It was not anything that I was qualified to do or had any experience doing, mm -hmm. but I just felt like just such a passion because I thought, those girls don't even know that they could be entrepreneurs yet. And if we lose them, then Silicon Valley is just going to keep looking this way another 15 years in the future. And so you've done children's books, chill, like t take us yeah. through just a, a laundry list of, um, <laughs> and you were also in the meantime on Broadway. Like I know you've, you've been very busy. You've Thank very much you. separated yourself um, um, from, from the company. I mean, you did go out and build this whole thing kind of on your own. So give us a laundry list. <laughs> You know, my whole life I wanted to sing on Broadway. Even during all the times when I was at Facebook and in the years after, mm -hmm. a lot of the media would kind of use me as this like point counterpoint with Mark. Like Mark is like this genius who's building important things and Randy is like this silly sister who likes to sing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so I don't think anyone in my life took that dream seriously of mine. And then, in 2014, sweet, sweet, you know, uh, victory, I um, got cast in a role in Rock of Ages, an 80s rock musical on Broadway. And it was just this moment where, like, A, I got to live my number one bucket list dream, but also I got to experience firsthand the power of art and media and culture to change mm. people's minds and to convey a story. So from there, I decided, all right, I want to you know, I think I can tackle this issue of getting more women and girls into technology from pop culture and media and the arts. Hmm. I, um, I wrote uh, two children's books, Dot, which is about a very spunky little girl who builds, she wears a pink dress, but she also builds robots. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's now a show on CBC, Universal Kids, uh, Hulu, and all over the world. It's in many different languages now. Missy President, which is about a, a girl whose homework assignment goes viral online and she wakes up to find that all of America has voted for her for president and <laughs> kind of talking about what it means to get, be a good digital citizen and you know what it means to have a voice online as a young person today. And then my final project uh, that I uh, launched recently is called Sue's Tech Kitchen. It is an actual physical space that we've launched in nine cities around the country where you could go and have a robot make you chocolate. Get 3D printed s'mores, a really approachable way to teach 
young girls, young children, their families about tech in a way that hopefully makes it stick. Well, it's just interesting because it's very much like let's show the human side of technology and let's also like educate younger people to yes. be able to almost change the Silicon Valley that we know, the one that you helped build, that your brother has built. You know, it, it is very much mm -hmm. a, a giving back in a, in a different way to change the narrative for the future. I just, I keep remembering every single thing that I do now. I really play in my head the moment that Facebook launched a Facebook Live button on two billion profiles around the world. And I just, I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, when I started this journey of going out to Silicon Valley, I did not think of myself as an entrepreneur. I didn't think of myself as anyone who would create anything or invent anything. I just saw myself as a marketer who was supporting the other people. But what that experience in Silicon Valley showed me is that every single one of us has the potential to be a creator and inventor and it is honestly my life mission to make sure that more women and girls feel that way. You talked about kind of always have to have each other's backs as family and, and how Mark would always show up when you were singing in choir and so you were talking before about um, living out your dreams of being on Broadway and singing. Um, did he come visit you then? <laughs> So I think the big question when I went to sing on Broadway was, you know, was, is Mark going to come see the show? And um, we were going back and forth on it. And he was like, you know, Randy, I really want to see your show, but I have a meeting with the president. And like, I really just can't leave this meeting with the president. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like my entire life I've wanted to sing on Broadway. I'm finally singing on Broadway. Like I made you sit at every a cappella concert that I ever had. Like you need to come see this moment for me. So he actually ended up cutting a meeting with President Obama short and taking a helicopter to land like right near the theater so that he could come see my Broadway debut. What do you think is the future um, of this complicated time in technology? I think it's complicated because I think some of the discussions that we're having around tech are probably disincentivizing more women and girls of going into tech desperately at a moment where we need their leadership more than ever. I think when you start to have more diversity at the table at these companies, when you have more representation of what people are thinking around the world, you don't launch products that alienate people. Mm. And so I think these tech companies are desperately at a moment where we need more diversity in the top ranks of these companies more than ever, yet I think that some of the issues that we're seeing might be turning a lot of that great talent off from going into the space. When you talk about Facebook Live and the power of it, it's such a great example of like, you know, the power and also the bad things that can be used. And if you look at this idea of giving everyone a voice, which is truly kind of the heart of the internet, um, we're in this new era where you have like social media with Facebook, spreading some of this content in a way that has never been spread before because it's so quickly. It certainly has to change the way of thinking beyond just making that decision that everyone should have a, boy, a voice. Now we're, we have a whole new set of problems. What do you think are the questions we need to ask in the future about it? I think the questions we need to be thinking about are what are the complications that are gonna arise 10 years from now that we are not even thinking about today. Because I think that is the problem, is that tech is so now, now, now. What are we building that's you know changing and disrupting the world today that we miss the big picture, which is that the things we do today are going to change the world, not really for us, but for our children and their children. So I think about that all the time. Like I, I think about virtual reality and some of the things with Oculus and some of the things that are going on. And I think, oh my gosh, this is going to have just incredible implications in healthcare, the surgeries we're gonna be able to do, real estate, selling buildings to people that aren't even built yet, or education. My kids will travel the world before they even leave middle school. But then I also think, are we gonna be treating high school students for PTSD because they're playing war games that feel so real they think they're in them? Hmm. And I don't think enough people are asking those tough questions right now. Facebook I, owns uh, Oculus. So is that their responsibility to ask those questions? I mean, I do believe that those issues are being raised inside Facebook right now. They've amassed the best and the brightest talent from all over the world to be thinking through these issues. I think the big problem, though, is that sometimes we don't even know what questions to be asking. I mean, I think that 
probably we're asking a lot of smart questions about AI and machine learning and robotics and what that's going to do with, with jobs and automation. But I don't think we're asking the tough questions of like what happens in the short term when humans and robots are competing for the same jobs. You know, I think we're, and so I worry sometimes that we're just not asking the right questions when it comes to the ethics and that there's not enough diversity in the room weighing in on these opinions to really make sure that the correct questions are being asked. One of the things I thought you said that was interesting earlier, because I was in the room and I remember like the senators asking some of these questions. Um, there was just so little knowledge of, of tech and, and many of these questions displayed that there needed to be more knowledge of tech. Um, they got a lot of heat for this. I think those hearings, they really showed how little attention that our leaders have paid to technology. I think that until a few years ago, people thought that there were just a bunch of kids out in suburban California that were like tinkering with some gadgets and creating some things and oh, that's cute, that's good for them, you know, but, but we have our banks and our financial institutions and, and that's what really matters. And you know, in some way, maybe what happened with this last election is actually going to end up being good for the world because maybe it made people pick up their heads and see the power and see what's being built out in Silicon Valley and appreciate it for the impact it is having in the world instead of thinking it's some siloed thing across the country. And maybe now our political leaders, our business leaders, ourselves as customers will actually educate ourselves in the way that we deserve. Tech leaders are kind of realizing we don't get, you don't get to just say, we're over here, you know, we're moving fast and breaking things and over here's the government and we're not going to have, you know, our way is the way. That certainly seems like it's changing yeah. too. I do think, I mean, that used to be the motto plastered all over the walls of Facebook and other tech companies was, you know, move fast, break things and it's better to get something done than be perfect. Mm -hmm. and. I certainly think that mentality is changing because now, you know, I think leaders and tech companies have also realized the tremendous power they have. That being said, you know, one of the things I've always appreciated about Silicon Valley is just this kind of ambitious drive to change the world and make things better. I mean, I know we laugh about cryptocurrency and blockchain a lot as a, as a hype and a craze, um, but if we, if you were living in Venezuela right now, if you were living in a country with hyperinflation that couldn't trust their government and their banking system, like you would be very thankful for people in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. who are trying to find a new way to create a decentralized currency that fixes that. So I think what we need to find in the world is we need to find a way to not stifle that kind of innovation and growth and huge thinking but just do it in a way that doesn't have quite as dire consequences in the long term. You know, how do you feel as his sister, as someone at Facebook, and as someone who cares deeply about technology, about people genuinely questioning the impact of his creation yeah. and whether it's good for humanity? I think one thing that we can all say about my brother, what, you know, no matter what anyone feels about him, is that he has always just been an incredible trailblazer of pushing the boundaries you know of what he sees where he sees the world should go and you know he has pushed a lot of us to think of the world in a bigger more connected way than we ever thought it would be and you know he has never been phased by what other people think of him or what the media thinks of him and I, I have to say thank goodness for that because I think if he was the kind of person who cared you know, how other people reacted, we wouldn't even have half of the amazing contributions that Facebook has made to the world. So, you know, for better or worse, Mark is not the kind of person who is swayed by what you or I or anyone thinks of him. And uh, because of that, I think we're gonna get a lot more amazing things out of him in the years to come.